Thanks to one of the greatest events in the history of jiu-jitsu, Nicky Rod walked away with the $1 million prize after an absolutely dominating performance. In this video, we'll be breaking down the underlying anatomy and biomechanics of two clips from his final match against Felipe Andrew. All right, so the first view is the body lock pass that Nicky Rod hit on Felipe Andrew. Uh, we'll see it when he first tried it and then whenever he actually succeeded and see why he didn't make it through the first time he tried to do the body lock pass. Uh, and then we'll look through all of the mechanics that he, whenever he was successful with the actual body lock pass. All right, so let's go back and we'll see that, that uh, Felipe has his leg kind of locked down here. So whenever he reaches to go over with his right leg at first, when he flexes his hip up and over, you can see he doesn't quite get it high enough. And that's because he's preventing his leg from extending and externally rotating. Okay, so if the knee were to come higher, with the, the hip line were to stay the same, then the hip were to come high, or the knee were to come higher, that would be hip extension. If his shoulder or his uh, heel were to come closer to his butt, like in this position here with his right leg, that would be hip external rotation. So he's not allowing his leg to do that, which didn't allow him to extend the spine enough and get the leg over. So what does he do? He readjusts and he needs to free this leg. So as soon as the angle changes, that leg is freed. And as soon as he frees it, you can see it, you can't quite see it, but you can see his right leg coming around and he, uh, uh, you can see Felipe's leg up here so you know it's not locking down his left leg. So as soon as he does that, we're gonna start here at the shoulder. He starts to get that really good, but he's got the body lock grip, but he's got, can't see what kind of grip he's got, but he's in that body lock position to start the pass. So he's pinning the leg and at the shoulder and the rest of the forearm, he's got the really nice isometric contraction with his forearm flexors, really bicep and tricep. It's really, hence the name isometric. For those of you who don't know what isometric means, it means that the muscle's contracting without actually changing in length. Okay, so really nice isometric contraction there, but what happens whenever he starts to lift, flex that hip up, is he actually horizontally adducts and extends his shoulder. Horizontal adduction happens with muscles like the pec major and the anterior delt, and it extends with muscles like the lat and the teres major, just to name, just to name a couple. So when that happens, he's able to pin this leg so that he can't flare the knee out like he did the last time and prevent this left or right hip of Nicky Rod from coming over the top. So, but whenever he does that, at, we'll move up to the hip now, as he flexes his hip, he shows us an immense amount, uh, just an incredible display of, of hip flexion mobility here with muscles like the psoas major, the rectus femoris, and the TFL, and there are others, uh, but those are some of the main ones. So, and at the acetabular femoral joint, this is about as much flexion as you can get. Uh, he, he does, it's even more impressive because gravity is, gravity's helping him a little bit, but he doesn't have any passive motion or passive pressure to help him get into that position. So he's able to access that during an athletic movement. Makes it, makes it much more impressive. So as he does that, now we're gonna move to a more global concept called the hip and shoulder line dissociation. So you can see, and the, the camera angle switches in between, so just kind of bear with me there. Look at the line of his shoulders versus the line of his hips. So if you guys are new here, I like to imagine it by drawing a line between the shoulders and then drawing a line through the hips. So through the shoulders and through the hips, and that represents the plane of the shoulders and the hips respectively. So look what happens here as soon as he clears that leg. So whenever he starts to switch his hips, and he flexes his hip again to kind of get that other leg out so that his left leg can drop down to the mat. This is very reminiscent of what Gordon Ryan looked like whenever I looked, we watched his hip switch pass, even though he did it from the headquarters position. The shoulders are parallel to the ground, the plane of the shoulders, and the plane of the hips are almost completely perpendicular to the ground. This is, again, a wonderful display of mobility. He went from a relatively flexed position in the spine globally to relatively extended globally. However, the, the most impressive portion of this is the, the ability, like most athletes have, most really good athletes have, if you've seen any of my previous videos breaking down these movements, is the ability to dissociate the hips and the shoulders. So at the thoracolumbar junction, where the thoracic spine meets the lumbar spine, and at the lumbosacral junction, where the lumbar spine meets the sacrum, he's doing left relative left rotation, and it's happening inferior to the thoracolumbar junction. 
So if he were to be sitting on the ground and rotating his body, that would be happening superior to the thoracolumbar junction. But since his shoulders are planted on the ground, were planted on, on Felipe, and his hips are moving about the shoulders, it's inferior to the thoracolumbar junction. And then he drops his knee down and completes the pass. All right, we'll talk through it really quick one more time and then we'll watch it full speed. So he tries to get the other leg up. He's unable to extend and externally rotate the other knee and therefore extend his spine, giving him a little bit more movement to get the knee above, but that's okay because he maintains position, corrects, frees his other leg. As he's got that good isometric contraction with the body lock, he horizontally adducts and extends his shoulder or the humerus at the glenohumeral joint to keep that leg from flaring out so that his right leg, can, his right hip, the acetabular femoral joint can flex. Unbelievable amount of mobility again. And as it flexes and clears that leg, he then dissociates his shoulders and his hips around the thoracolumbar junction and then drops his left leg to the mat, completing the pass. Let's watch it full speed and then we'll move on to the next view. Awesome. Okay, now this view, we're just gonna start in the position of the body triangle. We'll break down kind of what's happening at the joints, at, you know, anatomically, biomechanically, at the, at the hip joint, knee joint, ankle joint, all that with the, with the body triangle, and then we'll look at the actual cinching of the rear naked choke. So, at, on the leg that's kind of across, so the, the hip, the left hip here would be externally rotated pretty much as much as it'll go. Uh, until it gets around the leg, it stays in an externally rotated position, and the the, at the tibiofemoral joint, or where the, the femur meets the tibia, the tibia is externally rotated relative to the femur. And that allows that, that really particular angle that you want to cinch up that body triangle. Now the ankle at the Taylor curl joint is dorsiflexing along the popliteal space, or the back of the knee of, the, of his right knee, with, the, with anterior tibialis uh, primarily, dorsiflexes the, the foot. Now on his right leg, he, you know, everybody knows the, the hamstrings in the back of the thigh, they flex the knee and it creates that good cinch uh, for the body triangle. Now if we roll over and the, the angle changes, we'll see that we didn't really get to see him sink in the rear naked choke. He already had the grip, uh, which really good, you know, jujitsu guys do that on the transition, so it's not surprising. Let's look at his choking hand. His choking hand is flex, his, his elbow is flexed at the humeral ulnar joint. His, the muscle bellies of his bicep and the muscles of his extensor supinators are on the, the, the bottom or the back, if we're talking about anatomical position, the back of the hand, or excuse me, the back of the wrist and the elbow, those muscles extend the wrist and supinate the wrist and extend the fingers. Those muscles, muscles like the, just to name a couple, the brachioradialis, the extensor carcoradialis, longus and brevis, uh, the extensor digitorum, all of those muscles are isometrically contracted and kind of tucked under his other arm, uh, Nikki's other arm, uh, to create this cinching motion that's gonna eventually cinch down on the trachea and the carotid artery on the left. On the right, he, creating this really tight kind of locked position is his, you can't see it, but this is how you do a rear naked choke. He's got his forearm flexors and the muscles on the opposite side that we talked about earlier. They are flexed down into the back of his head, pushing him into cervical flexion, creating less room for that trachea for him to get, to him to get some air. Along with that, he's also using his triceps up here, even though he's in a flex position, to extend his elbow. And this is an isometric contraction because there's a lot of resistance there. It's not actually gonna straighten out. Uh, but if, if Felipe's head wasn't there, it would just straighten out. So nice isometric contraction, pushing the elbow into extension and the forearm into flexion and probably a fair amount of pronation. That is creating a situation where both of the carotid arteries and the trachea are unable to carry blood or get air to the brain respectively. And he taps almost immediately. All right, so one more time, the left, sorry, the left hip is externally rotated. 
The, at the tibiofemoral joint, you have tibial external rotation. You've got Taylor curl dorsiflexion, and then you have hip or knee flexion on the opposite side to sense that down. As we move over, we've got an isometric contraction. We have an isometric contraction of the biceps and the elbow flexors up at the top of the forearm. And then we have the, the tricep that's extending the elbow isometrically, even though it's in a flex position. And then the forearm flexors that are pushing down on his head causing him to tap. So full speed to watch it all in action. All this is happening so quickly, which makes it, you know, something like jujitsu that much more impressive, really any martial art. And less than a second later, the shirt comes off deservedly. Awesome. Now, hopefully you have a decent understanding of what's going on anatomically and biomechanically, although they probably won't be executed nearly as well as Nikki did. I was already a fan of Nikki Rod, but I've definitely become more of a fan after this performance. Thank you guys for watching and I'll see you next time.